Hey guys, Christy asked me what I was going to do today and I said I was going to put Johnny's work clothes on. And really what I mean is I'm going to put some of the accessories on that were on the old Johnny. Been needing to do this for quite some time. Along the way I wanted to show you some of the differences between a 2014 1025R and a 2018 model. We'll start right here at the front. We've talked about this before. The way you open the hood is different. The 2014 had a nice simple latch right at the top. This one, no, it's got this hole here that you have to insert something into to pop the hood loose. Before I do that, I want to show you, at least on this tractor, this one had 50 hours on it, so there's going to be several times in this episode that I'm going to say, uh, gee, I don't know if this was this way from the factory or if something happened while the first owner. This is not a very good fit here. Uh, it's, it's loose. You can actually kind of see under the hood here. So not a very good fit. It either feels like that hood's been bent downward to be closed right from the front, or it never did fit very well, I don't know. But all we have to do is take a screwdriver. I've got a flat blade here. I think a Phillips would probably work better because it would be more pointed. Stick right in there, and it pops up. That shows us the second difference. The 2014 did not have these uh, pneumatic cylinders or hydraulic cylinders, I don't know, whatever they're called. It was manual, you, you brought it up and latched it in the back. I think in 2016, thereabouts, they introduced these automatic cylinders. That's a nice improvement. I know you'll probably hear some background noise, but it, it's cold in here. I don't have any heat in my shed yet, nor do I have any insulation. So I set up a little heat over here on the other side of the tractor. Hey, let's get on to step two. The next thing are these nice little yellow, I don't know, fasteners that, that replace the bolts that were in the 2014. Now we can put a part number to that fastener in the description. My understanding is from several folks that have tried it, this fastener will work on the older models. So if that fastener is fascinating to you, you can get a set of those and make it easier to work with your 2014 model or anything before, I don't know, I think it's 2017 or so for that. Boy, it's quick to get the side off. I like that. Now I'm just taking a quick look in here. This is on the left side of the tractor. I'm not sure what it is in here yet, but something has changed. This is a lot easier to access right in here. Uh, when I put the TKV20 wiring in to the 2014 model, it was much more difficult to reach in here. Something's changed. I wish I had the other tractor side by side so I could actually see the difference. A lot more space in here. Maybe they're making room for a big 50 horsepower engine in the future. Yeah, right. Okay, this is where the differences really begin to show up. A lot of folks have been commenting about how my tractor doesn't look like the one in your video. My floorboard's not easy to get off. Well, you're right. I see it right here, and I agree it's not easy to get off. Let me explain what I see that has changed. This piece now is structural. It's replaced a big piece of steel that was in there, and it goes all the way up through to the steering column and everything, I believe. Before, I would just remove this little kind of a U-shaped piece of plastic, and the floorboard came right up. Now that this is structural, that's much more difficult. So I'm going to explain the changes. Uh, what's m more difficult, what's different about taking this floorboard off than the one on the 2014 model? So I'd recommend you taking a look at that video. We'll put a card up in the corner. There'll be, it'll be in the end screen as well. But I would take a look at it before you start on this one. It goes through step by step how to take these off. For instance, I've already removed these five bolts on each side. I've already removed the little rubber cushion that sets on top of here just so we have just the basics because this is not going to be easy. Okay, I've done this several times off camera just to prove that I know the secret recipe. I think I've got it now and it'll probably still seem like I'm fumbling because this is not easy. All I've done is take out the five bolts on each side, take off the rubber platform. Now what you'll notice is it's, it's loose here on the back, but it seems to be hooked up here in front. It also seems to rub against the fender. What I've learned off camera is that I can remove it, but I'm not sure I can remove it without scratching the fender here. The first thing I do is I bring it up and backwards and then I encounter that these, these electrical lines here get caught under this side. This is loose over here now. The other side's actually harder. 
Okay, so now we're on the right side of the tractor. There is some steel under here. I'm not exactly sure what it is. It doesn't really matter for the, this point. But that steel doesn't allow the platform to go backwards very easily. So what I found is I have to kind of try to hold on to the whole thing and bend it. Okay, it does bend. I bend it like a little like this. And that lets it come up. And then I come backwards. Now, at first I was trying to get greedy and pull it all up in one motion. And I learned that won't work because of the four wheel drive lever. So I pull it up. Oh, and it also hits over on the differential lock pedal. So I kind of work it over the differential lock pedal and back here. And then I can kind of go back and forth. I'm caught up on those electrical uh, cables I told you about and out it comes. I guess it's not that difficult after I've done it three or four times, but wow, it's a significantly more complex than it was on the earlier models. Okay, there's what mine looks like. It's kind of odd, everything's dusty in here except for this one shaft. I maybe need to check with my John Deere dealer to see if this thing's had any warranty service on it. That's one thing about buying a used tractor, you don't really know, but this almost looks like it's a new shaft. If not, it somehow avoided all this other dust. This looks significantly different in here. It's much simpler with the exception of this one hydraulic line. I haven't figured out what that is yet. It may be feeding the power steering. The earlier models had a lot more small steel pieces in here. This looks sturdy and tough. It's not that I'm saying it's been cheapened, it's just simplified. So we've been working to put Johnny's work clothes on this afternoon. And what I mean by that is the Artillion Diverter Control, the Terra King TKV-20 Grass Collection System. Those are the two main controls we're trying to run from the front of the tractor to the rear tractor, or <laughs> in the Artillion case, from the rear tractor to the side of the tractor over here. The act of installing those things has actually made me look a lot more detail at differences between this tractor and the 2014 that we had before. I thought maybe I should go through some of those. For instance, right up here, there's a new shield. I mean, it's real heavy steel. I don't know if they were worried about something being thrown back out of the fan, but there's one on the other side as well that uh, didn't exist on the 2014 model. I've talked a little bit already about how this is one piece, big molded, I don't know, I guess you call it plastic, but it's a heavy, heavy poly. It's, it's really strong and tough. It's one piece all the way from here all the way up here, you can see it on this side best. I think there's a, this is a, an attached piece here. This is not part of it, but uh, this is all one big mold. I suspect this is a cost reduction and probably only a cost reduction when they get up to a, a large volume, right? So when these tractors were first designed, the volumes were not nearly as high as they are now. So even though this tractor on the outside looks the same, there's been a lot of internal changes. Another example is how the fuse block is done. On the other tractor, it was, it was just, it was mounted all differently here. Now, when I first opened this up, this bolt was laying right here. And I thought, uh-oh, what's going on? Well, I took it out of there not knowing what it was, and then I figured it out later when I began to take the fuse block apart to put the uh, artillery and grapple on it again. It's just like this bolt here. Now, the thing is, it was at the top, but you can see exactly how that's supposed to go. And I'm sure I've lost the sleeve and the nut. I don't know, this would probably hold like this, but I'm not real comfortable with it. I think I'll probably go ahead and get, get this put back in place someday soon. But I was able to connect the uh, Artillion diverter kit just like I did before. I bought myself a, a, a new fuse just like the other ones here. Uh, and put it right into the fuse block. So as I'm getting ready to run these wires, the first thing I noticed was that this section here of the frame is dramatically different than the 2014 model. There were a lot of smaller pieces of steel in there. Uh, you can look back at my video where I removed the floorboard or the uh, diverter kit installed. There's been several times where you've seen the floorboard off my 2014 model to see the difference here. So that made the task of running the wires different. Uh, it turns out easier, I think, but I just kind of wanted to mention that to start with. So with the diverter kit installed, just like before, we start up here, and we had two wires that run down. They run right behind the fender here, 
and then I, they, they come out right in here. I have to figure out how to get those up to power. I brought them all the way to the fuse block and this piece up to be able to connect to the loader to actually run the diverter. So I should take a moment here just to kind of illustrate some of the ground rules that I'm playing by anytime I'm trying to run wires on a piece of equipment like this. First, let's talk about potential dangers of the tractor itself. You need to avoid heat, right? So you don't want a wire sitting right by the engine block uh, or right by some other component that's gonna get really hot. The next thing we wanna avoid is any, any rubbing friction that might happen. So we don't want a wire to go you know, next to a shaft that's gonna be spinning, uh, next to a, a lever that's gonna be frequently operated. And the third thing we wanna avoid that the tractor itself might damage on a wire is pinching. So for instance, if we come in here and we run a wire right over the top of that frame, there's a risk that putting the floorboard on there will mash that wire and pinch it. And over time, it'll become ineffective. Those are kind of the three things that I try to guard against uh, and anybody guards against. It sounds pretty basic. If you've done a lot of this type of work, then this is too basic for you. But a lot of our viewers find this useful, so I, I, wanna, I wanna go through a little bit of detail on that. Okay, in addition to the tractor itself, we have to be worried about some external environmental issues. For instance, what about all the brush? When I'm mowing brush, the brush that comes under the tractor, we, we run over it. Sometimes I run over some pretty big stuff, and well, when I'm out there on the tractor, I really don't wanna have to be concerned about being careful. Uh, about running over brush or, or, or damaging a wire that might be dangling. So I want to make sure that I don't let a, a wire dangle down here and be the lowest point. I don't want it to, to have a little loop in it where it could get hooked. Let's say this is a brush and as the wire's got a loop, it could hook it and pull and tear it out. In fact, in a uh, brush mowing video, that actually happened and uh, I had to go get a new wire uh, from, for the Artillion diverter. I didn't even have the diverter plugged in that day and it was just dangling, and it was negligence on my part. Another thing I want to be careful about is the rear tire itself. We're in there under that fender, and we want to be careful to make sure that we don't throw mud up and let mud or any sort of brush that we might be pulling with the tire pull around and get that uh, wires, anything that we run in there, cause them damage. Okay, so we ran the wire here. I'm really not going to show you under the fender, but it seemed simpler under there. It seemed like it was uh, less congestion from the hard lines and um, it was a lot easier to run the wire. It came right down here on the inner side of this and then that's where it splits apart between power and the control line here. I was able to stay on the outside of this, of this main frame. One thing I noticed was there's no way to get through this main frame. There are no holes in it that I could run wires through so I had to choose at one end or other whether I was going to stay on the outside of the frame or the inside of the frame. There's one exception to that. Right under this piece here, if you don't have any connector on your wire, there's a little slit about a quarter of an inch high that you can slide a wire under. I used that for this power wire here. I decided not to run the control wire that direction. So I used zip ties, tied it all along here. This right here, this lever is the brake lever. And it's not going to be used very often. After all, I rarely hit the brakes. I like to go. It's not frequently moved, but I still wanted to protect from it. So I actually bought some of this. Uh, it's called wire conduit. There, I think there's a, a more common name for this stuff. Wish I knew what it was. Hey, if you know what this stuff's called, let me know in the comments section. Okay, so we ran the power right up through here, through that slit. We ran the control over here. Okay, on the previous tractor, I actually wrapped the, this uh, extra Artillion diverter kit wire around the engine mount here, and I don't really think that was probably a great idea. And I was trying to figure out what to do this time, and I finally realized, hey, there, there's this loader mount has a big cavity in there. It's not easily accessible from the outside, so what I decided I would do is put this big roll of wire. I've got zip ties to keep it from coming apart. I'm just gonna push it down in that cavity and leave it in there like that. See, it stays right in the cavity. I think that'll work. Now there's a chance brush could get in there and pull that out, I guess. I, I could also zip tie these two ends together. There's a little hole in the engine mount here. 
I'll see if I can zip tie all of this together. Okay, with this approach, even if it does get pulled out of that cavity, it shouldn't get yanked down very far, but that, you know, we'll see. That's not a perfect solution. And I think this should be plenty of cord for the diverter kit to hook to. Okay, that pretty much does it for the diverter kit wiring. Let's go to the other side of the tractor and begin to check out the TKV20 wiring. On the front here, I went through the same hole to get up to the battery. Everything inside the battery box is the same it was on the original TKV20 installation video. Go check out that video. Um, you can see a lot of detail that I'm probably not going to show here. This bracket here, I talked about this on the other side of the engine. It changes a little bit how the wires are ran from the 2014. I come up here and I've got, right now I've got this wire loose and it's sitting right up against the exhaust. That would burn it. So let's take a zip tie and tie that down to this other wiring harness. There we go. And we'll do that again on the back side of it. I really like to follow other wiring where possible. I feel like the engineers at Deere have taken a lot of effort to figure out where to run the wires. They're trying to avoid all the same things I mentioned and maybe even things I haven't thought of yet. So where possible, I like to follow existing wiring. Now, as I was saying earlier, there's a lot more space in here. The first, uh, the first time we had a hard time wiring this little pigtail in there, this time I just reached in with both hands and wired it right up. No problem at all. Makes me wonder what they removed. Okay, so we had trouble going across the engine last time with this particular harness. And there's a little pigtail here. Again, check out the original TKV20 installation video and you'll see how that fits in to get power right there. This was very difficult on the other tractor. It's easy here. This is an amazing amount of space. I think there's room for a fourth cylinder. I really think we ought to go for the 50 horsepower 1025R. That's what I want, more power. <laughs> with the Artillion diverter kit, I stayed on the outside of the frame. With the TKV20, I'm thinking the opposite approach. I actually came down in here and stayed on the inside of the frame. And using my rule of following existing wiring, I zip tied this right to the existing wiring harness that goes to the back of the tractor. There's even a clip that I was able to take the bolt out of, slide this harness in, and, and then we went right on back to the rear of the tractor, up the ROPS, and the resulting connector is right here. I'm taking a little bit of a different approach than what the TKV20 planned. Uh, I'm just going to leave this connector here rather than leaving all the switching here all the time. While I love the TKV20, it won't be used all the time on my tractor. Now you may use yours every week and so you may want to mount that switch right in here just like they suggest in the book. For me, I'm going to put that switch on only when I'm running the unit. Otherwise, I feel like there's more risk of me damaging that wiring when I'm doing something totally unrelated. And I've zip tied it right up there to the toolbox holder. Okay, we're going to try to put the floorboard back on now. So first I run through there. And as I mentioned taking it off, I try not to be greedy. I don't push it all the way down first. I'm just trying to get under these levers. So I'm trying to get under the differential lock pedal over there. You know, it's going to go a lot easier this time because I've got a lovely assistant. Next step, I had a, a little trouble with that. Next step is I've got to get this piece, Christy, right under the, the front. Yeah, and on that side, those wiring harnesses, yeah. make sure they're pushed up under there, and then we'll go down. And you have to give it a little bit of a bend upward towards you. See, like so? Uh, it has to be bent like this, okay? in order for this piece to go under here. Oh, it has to go under it. Yes. So we have to butterfly it a little bit. Oops, I'm back up on top here. There we go. See how they butterflied that? That butterfly trick is the, is the trick. Okay. You're all the way under on your side. I'm not quite yet. There I am. Okay, folks, the key word is butterfly. Yeah, I, I bend the sides upward slightly, and then it'll slide right under there. It's the only way I know to make it fit. It's time for the rubber mats. The rubber mat's supposed to go under there too, I think. Now well, maybe it goes on top. There's the rubber mat for this side. Now this front cover here was underneath. 
I'll do the same thing on this side. That's easy. Okay, Christy, here's your five. You're not cold, are you, Christy? On my side, I have to bend the fender in a little bit to make the holes line up. Now, this piece is identical, I believe, to the 2014, or at least it's uh, put on exactly the same way. Ready? There it goes. So, folks, what Christy did there, you might not have been able to see very well, was you have to pull down this differential lock lever to be able to get this piece of plastic on. Just by holding that plastic down, it goes in fine then. Hey, Christy, I wonder if Ken's differential lock pedal will work on here. I hope so. When we did the original differential lock pedal install, we showed you there's a little slot right here on the back side. So there is a front and a back to this device. That little slot goes over this knob right there. It'll slide right on there. And then it's just 7 16 to snug it right up. I don't expect you guys to do it from across the, the tractor. You should do it uh, on the same side, but I thought it would leave a little more space for the camera. We'll put this side panel back on, and that'll just about do it. So you get this back side in, you get the front down here in, and you slide it forward. These new little gizmos here to connect. And all done. No wrenches, Christy. Well, I hope you found that somewhat informative. We've installed several things and we've pointed out a lot of differences on the inside of the tractor that uh, normally you wouldn't see just on the lot. In fact, I hadn't noticed any of these differences, even though I've seen them at trade shows uh, several times. It just you don't notice till you really get in there and look. Now we've got some more things to install. Mostly on the bucket, we've got a bunch of bolt-on hook products. Johnny's pretty close to being ready for spring. I'm excited about that. Based on how chilly it is here in the barn, I think maybe we have a few days left before then. But thanks for watching everybody, and we'll see you next time on Tractor Time with Tim.